basically back in the days when people thought that the earth was flat, and the church thought so and everybody else did too, and the idea of it being round was f first floated, then a lot of people thought that people on the opposite side of, of the earth, the antipode of the earth, would have to be walking on their heads, wouldn't they? And that makes perfect sense, right? Intuitive. Um, it took people a long time to realize that, you know, gravity works in these, this mysterious way, and etc. But the thing is that now we do actually have a lot of people who uh, walk on their heads uh, because the economic paradigm that we're all following is, is really kind of an upside down version of what humans have been doing through their three million years worth of evolution. And so we, we're living through a very short evolutionary episode, if you will, um, where we're all just basically walking around on, on our heads. The, um, the strategy really leads to collapse. It, it doesn't really lead to anything else. There are no other possible outcomes. Um, it's really a, a fundamentally flawed idea. Um, it can only work for a short period of time when you can expand the use of natural resources. And once that no longer works, it works for an even shorter period of time while it is still possible to endlessly expand debt. But that runs its course rather quickly and, again, leads to collapse. So, since that's what's going on now, what we need to do is flip ourselves right side up again and become like humans have been for the past three million years. And then we stand a chance. And if we don't do that, then we do not stand a chance. So that's what I will try to explain. So this is how humans tend to relate to each other. This is the, the normal relationship pyramid, if you will. Um, sort of like the food pyramid. And imagine at the bottom you have your basic starches, and above that you have your vegetables, and uh, at the very top you have bacon or, or what have you. <laughs> So, if, if you eat nothing but bacon, then I think you'd die. I'm not sure. I think you'd die of pellagra or some nasty disease like that. Uh, it's kind of a form of starvation. So you don't want to do that. Um, but this is how people normally relate to each other. Uh, most of their relationships are normally close relationships with their family members, members of their clan. Most of us are, well, all of us actually are physiologically evolved to have about a dozen people who are close to us and then maybe a hundred people who are acquaintances, allies, strangers we know and maybe trust a little bit. And then beyond that is the universe of people we really don't care about no matter what we say to ourselves. So um, this is what's programmed into us over you know three million years worth of evolution and and Although people pay lip service to there being billions and billions of people in the world alive today, that's like billions and billions of stars in our galaxy. We can't get there. They're, they're not us. They're not our family. They're not our acquaintances. We don't know them. So this is really how people relate to each other. And if they don't, then strange things happen. So this is how normally over many, many years people have done business together, if you will. At the very bottom, the foundation of, uh, of our food or whatever hierarchy, food is pretty important, of course, uh, but this, is, this includes everything, food, shelter, everything else that we need to survive. Mostly we rely on gifts, especially when we're very small or newborn or just growing up. Basically. Uh, everything that people give us is a gift and we aren't um, expected to reciprocate until we at, le at least learn to walk and talk and maybe do some chores and other things. The reciprocation is in the future, so we accumulate gifts during our first 15 years of life, maybe 20, uh, maybe 25 if there's grad school involved. And then, <laughs> and then we're expected to Recom recompense, compensate for everything we've been given as a gift later on. So tribute and barter is sort of a, a layer above that which um, involves people that we um, that aren't really in a gift relationship with us so uh, there we expect the compensation to be more immediate and, and the terms to be 
to some extent negotiated but not necessarily involved the operation of anything we could call a free market. It, it's really still personal relationships. It's not, um, it's not some kind of a, a public scheme. And at the very top of it we have trade which um, generally has always been reserved for various key items, uh, luxury goods, uh, weapons, um, uh, symbols that, uh, that convey social status, not necessities of daily life. There were no convenience stores a few thousand years ago where you could go and buy a Twinkie. That is a new invention. So here, here's basically, just to, to recap and define better what I just said, trade is, is really, it involves goods and services exchanged specifically for monetary units, abstract units of, of value, which um, generally involve forming a monopoly. Money is a monopoly wherever it exists. Um, it presupposes the existence of a market where there are market prices that are somehow established through a large number of transactions and averaged across them. And social status is based on one's possession of these abstract monetary units. So um, everybody's plugged into a monopolistic system that issues and controls the distribution of money and who they are depends on how many of these abstract units they manage to accumulate through trade. Tribute is very different. Um, it, it involves contributions and donations and these can be based on all sorts of things, allegiance, uh, religion, tradition, charity. And social status is not based on how much money you have but how much money you can, uh, you can give away to, to support some local institution or tradition. And this has existed for a long time. Some, some forms of tribute are basically an effort to make peace. So instead of waging war, you actually make payments. Uh, that is a very typical scheme. Somebody conquers you and then you decide that being reconquered endlessly is a bad idea. So you just pay your conquerors not to conquer you again. And that for a lot of nations has turned out to be a very successful scheme. Um, barter is People think that barter is just an extension of a free market, but really it's a different kind of system where you take into account somebody else's needs on, on some level. So if you're, if you're trading onions for potatoes, you, you take into account what the need for onions and potatoes is very locally involving the people that you're doing this with as opposed to uh, in some abstract market that exists outside your, your local community or scope. And gift is again very different because a gift presupposes reciprocity on some level. You don't give gifts expecting to never get anything back. That is automatically a disqualification for a gift. Um, and uh, social status is based on how generous one is, on one's generosity. Now generosity is one of those amazing, very highly evolved cultural universals, human cultural universals. Every society understands what generosity means. And it's something that involves a balance, which is an amazing thing. If you think of a virtue that involves a ba the, the, the notion of a balance as, as a core principle, this is one of the few. Uh, I can't think of any other examples, really, because you can't be overly generous. That's, that's bad. You can't be not generous enough. Um, that's also bad. You, you're really looking at somebody else's personal needs and it also it involves understanding somebody else and establishing a, a gift-based relationship. So gifts are really rather amazing in the scheme that, that we have. Now, some of my perspective on this comes from um, growing up in the USSR, which never had much of a market economy. Um, and and uh, goods were not so much sold as distributed and usually when when something <coughs> appeared for sale, let's say bananas, uh, the news would uh, spread through the, uh, through the neighborhood like wildfire and people would, would queue up to, to snap, all, all, snap up all of the bananas that were made available. And the term that was used for when something appeared for sale is something got thrown out. So there, you're there to not, to, not so much to buy it as to pick it up. And, and whether you had money to pay for it or not was kind of beside the point because if you didn't have money then somebody might give you some because it wasn't about money, it was about access. And buying and selling for profit or reselling things was generally called speculation. So it was actually 
quite reasonable to get three times as, as many bananas as, as you needed and then uh, sell off two-thirds of those bananas provided you charged exactly the same for them. But if you started marking them up, they will haul you off to jail for profiteering. Profiteering was illegal. So as a result of that, there was widespread reliance on personal favors because nobody really benefited from selling you the extra bananas. They were just doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. And then you were expected to compensate for that by giving them other forms of benefits and personal favors. Now, if you tried to pay for a favor, that would be a horrible insult. You could, you could be, get beat up for doing that. And, and status was not really based on possession, but on access to things, which, because it was all based on favors, was quite tricky. So there were also a lot of elements of gift economy, uh, where people would try to give gifts to each other in order to get something in return. Um, um, as an example, my, uh, my father was a professor, and some of the graduate students upon arrival would, would, would uh, lavish presents on him, bottles of cognac, and one, um, one student came up with a, a, a whole set of uh, uh, silver cutlery, which was rather extreme. My father turned that down, because how the hell do you compensate for that? He figured if, if that was the, the starting present, then the compensation would involve writing the guy's dissertation, which is a little too much to ask. <laughs> so, so that was declined. Um, True story. But the general expectation is that you know, family members will help each other out because if a family member refuses to help you out, then that family member loses honor within society. So if somebody turns you down, and that's a relative, and that relative is well off and you're not, then that relative may continue to be in some sense well off, but he's not well off socially. People will stop saying hello to him, uh, will not want to be seen with him in public. So, in any case, this was a, a doomed system just like this one. I'm not trying to say, oh yeah, we should go, go back to the Soviet way of doing things because, you know, in some ways it sucked. But, um, and it fell apart. But I'm just saying that this is a, a, an example of a much more humane way of doing things uh, that had retained some elements of earlier forms of, of social organization. So this is the new normal that we're living with, where we have trade dominating the top of our upside-down food pyramid. Uh, most of the things that we need, we can only get by paying for it, and um, involves dealing with strangers. Uh, tribute and barter uh, remain in some ways. The biggest form of tribute, of course, is taxes. Um, Barter, it, you know, it's, it's really marginalized in, in some ways and, and, and uh, you know, it happens, but it, uh, most of you would probably have trouble thinking up of good examples of, of barter in your daily lives. Um, m mostly it's things like, I'll help you move and then you'll help me move, or exchange of favors on that level. And, and gift is really just residual and, and um, not, not, doesn't play that important a part. The, the most important thing is that most interactions are impersonal. They're based on purchase and sale within a market system. So that if, if you're the loser in the transaction, it's, it's your fault. It's nobody else's fault because it's, it's your choice to deal with people you don't trust, with strangers. And, and, if, and, it's, it's, and therefore, it's your mistake. Nobody owes you anything. Um, if it's legal, in some sense, then there's really nothing you can fall back on and say, well, you weren't fair to me. Um, and tribute is really limited to taxes and uh, charitable donations and, and other impersonal status-seeking behaviors of the well-to-do. That is, if you have an access of capital from, from your monetary transactions, you can devote some of these to things that raise your status in some impersonal way because you don't personally have a relationship with whoever benefits. And gifts remain as vestigial cultural forms reserved for ceremonial uses, such as the engagement ring. Um, most importantly, everyone is completely dependent on financialized, commercialized, impersonal systems. And when these systems fail, as they do repeatedly, there is nothing for anyone to fall back on. 
Now, it turns out that this upside down living is um, leading straight to national bankruptcy. If, if you think about it in very general terms, if you have the, the normal pyramid, it's dominated by gifts and barter and, and, and tribute, which are part of the local economy. Everything circulates locally. And if you have some imports through trade, then that's just the, the tip, the very tip of the pyramid, the very top, reserved for luxury goods and, and, and some other things that, that you can't get locally that you absolutely need. But, but imports are restricted and, and uh, they don't dominate. So you, you can get anything you want just by calling in favors or receiving gifts, etc. You're not completely dependent on um, the outside world, as it were. In the upside down way of living, you have a flood of imports from low wage countries that dominates the economy. And the global economy dominates the, the entire uh, top of the upside down pyramid, with the local economy squeezed down to the bottom. And the most important thing to note is that the upside down mode is only possible while constantly taking on debt. The moment your credit lapses. The moment you can no longer expand your credit, you go bankrupt, your access to imports is lost. And then what you have left is the tiny little triangle at the bottom to, to provide you with everything you need to survive. Now, the question of debt is, is kind of a general question. Uh, interest used to be illegal. It's banned in the Bible. It's, it's illegal in Muslim countries. It's, um, it's generally a bad idea. And um, the idea of charging interest on loans is what all of our modern commerce and banking is, um, is based on. It presupposes sustained exponential growth because that's what compound interest is. And it, it's just an awful idea. It, it's, it's pretty brain dead. And the reason is that exponential growth in anything anywhere only produces one result, which is collapse. And the reason for that is that exponential growth outpaces any sustainable physical process in the universe outside of a few freak cases like a sustained nuclear explosion. <laughs> where the entire universe blows up and then we don't know what happens. <laughs> so, just to explain to you how bad an idea it is, let me throw out the most outlandish example available. If you can't beat this, then, then I, I think that it proves the point. Suppose we solve every single technical problem on Earth and then we go on and, and found space colonies and take over the solar system and the galaxy and other galaxies and the entire universe. So, suppose we have a space empire and also we, we tackle the problem of space travel so we can e expand this empire almost at the speed of light. You, you know, you can't go faster than the speed of light um, because a mass accelerated to the speed of light would have to have infinite energy. Um, so, then it turns out that our space colony can only expand as approxi appro approximately as time cubed because space is three-dimensional, uh, while our debt that, you know, the money that we had to borrow in order, in order to, to form this empire would grow as debt raised to T, which is time, which is exponential growth, D to the T. And if you play with the math a little bit, as T increases, D to the T becomes greater than T, T cubed for any value of D. That is, geometric growth is slower than exponential growth. It's a mathematical property. Now, what can you do about it? Well, suppose if you're a Star Trek fan and you believe in warp speed, you know, like warp 10 or whatever, which is faster than the speed of light. You think that would solve the problem? No, it wouldn't. No, that just changes the, uh, changes the number that, that you raise to, to, to the third power. And uh, in fact, nothing would fix this problem other than inventing a time machine and going back in time and settling your debts. So that's about the only thing that solves the problem and that's not in the works. So here's a little plot, you know, just a little graphing cal calculator that, that shows you your debt is in red, uh, your uh, space colony is, is in, in black, 
and your deficit is in blue. So a little bit of time goes on and then your deficit skyrockets and for all intents and purposes becomes infinite. So interest is a bad idea and any interest, even 0.1% is a bad idea and leads to collapse. But if you have 7% a year, then you get Bernie Madoff. That's the <laughs> difference. It's, it's a qualitative difference, not a quantitative one. Now, interest lending is, is kind of an interesting thing because it causes moral issues and difficulties, not just financial ones. So if you, if you lend at 0%, then that's actually not necessarily all bad. So if you have $100 sitting around and a friend of yours thinks of planting some apple trees, you can lend them $100. And then when the apple trees start bearing fruit, you get your $100 back. Plus, you might get some apples. So that's the reason to lend. It's the apples. It's not the hundred dollars because there's no interest on it. So that's a reasonable scheme. The only reason you do that is in the expectation of getting something useful, apples, for something useless, one hundred dollars that you're not currently using. Now lending with interest creates artificial interest in lending for things that are of no use to you personally, such as houses that you don't live in and don't even visit because somebody else is living in them that you don't know, cars that you won't get to drive or the person who buys the car will, won't even give you a ride, and of course capital for companies that offshore your jobs, you know, that's where your savings go. Um, so as soon as you give money to an institution that uses interest, um, you're basically doing things that are not necessarily helping you. They're helping somebody but not necessarily you. And also uh, interest um, introduces this uh, concept of risk premium. So for instance, uh, Greek debt is more expensive than American debt. I don't know why. Um, and I think that's just power of inertia than any, more than anything else. But you say, instead of saying, oh, we're not going to lend any money to Greece because they can't repay their debts. Well, instead, what we pay is, we will charge a higher interest on Greek debt because it's riskier. So. When you do that, eventually the whole economy becomes a bad credit risk and collapses. It's inevitable. So I think the outcome is perfectly predictable. Collapse is baked in into the scheme. It's guaranteed to occur. It, it is unavoidable. Now, what, what people seem to want to ask me a lot, and recently some, some money men took me out to dinner and they bought me dinner, which was nice, and entertained me with some conversation, but they really wanted to know the timing of collapse because they want to time the market. They, <laughs> they want to run away with all the chips, even if those chips are worthless, because that's how their mind works. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, I got all the chips. Too bad the casino is closed. <laughs> It's ridiculous, but you know, they paid for dinner, so that was okay. Um, but, but timing is completely irrelevant. The only thing you should be paying attention to is the fact that it is not too late for you to do things to prepare. And don't, don't think further than the next project that you can actually take on. Um, but most importantly, I think a, a cultural flip is needed to, to change from these impersonal, commercialized, relationships that involve strangers to personal relationships based on personal trust and, and the people that you actually know. So that, that involves getting, getting rid of some false gods and you know, these uh, faulty ideas have penetrated a lot of people's minds and you know, polluted them. Uh, the free market is considered efficient, efficient and optimal, for instance, and, and uh, a lot of people think that the unhindered market will pro spontaneously produce prosperity without end. And as it happens, the free market is a little bit better than a planned economy at chewing through all of the non-renewable resources and then spontaneously collapsing. So. You know, the Soviet Union was less efficient, so it collapsed first. That's it. That's all you get. That's all the benefit that you get is you collapse a little bit later because you're slightly more efficient. And so most of what you've been taught 
relating to economics has to do with the, the growth economy, which is over. And, and so people keep going on about this economic system that no longer exists and is irrelevant. And, and they have to understand that they've been given a bunch of ideology and, and, and a, basically a fake religion, uh, not science. And, and, and they should just get rid of this baggage because it's not helpful. Now, part of that baggage is this belief in efficiency, and it's a, it's a really nasty word, it turns out, because anybody can use it to mean anything, it turns out. So, it's more efficient to offshore industrial production to low-wage countries, right? Economic efficiency, you get more profit, and, and so that's more efficient. And it's, of course, more efficient to replace little mom-and-pop sh shops and specialty shops with big-box stores like Walmart. Uh, that uh, feature lower prices, right? It's more efficient to pay less and get more. And of course, it's more efficient to close these big, big box stores while, when, when the, the customers are all broke <laughs> because their jobs have been offshored to make the stuff that's cheap, okay? And after that, of course, it is more efficient for the government to just basically uh, demolish the towns and, and foreclose everyone and ship them out and, and, and pretend it never happened. So energy efficiency, you might think it's some kind of a special case which deserves more attention and uh, people often say, well, we must become more efficient. Well, not really, because if you look at efficient systems, they're more fragile, they're less resilient, they're, they're more tweaked, let's say, they're more, they're more highly optimized and every step in an optimization process makes the system more fragile, makes it more highly adjusted to its circumstances. Um, now, if you look at resilient systems, they operate nowhere near their capacity, and, and, and they're generally insensitive to things like quality and quantity of inputs. Um, they're not highly specialized. So you might have um, the example of a cat, which can eat just about any, any kind of an animal. Um, you know, it, it'll eat a cow if you help it. And, <laughs> And, but, but it'll also eat a vole, and that's fine. Um, and mostly it sleeps because, you know, what, what happens if the food runs short? Well, it'll sleep one hour a day less, you know, and hunt one hour a day more. And, and so it's very well adjusted to, uh, to just about anything. And then if you compare it to a, a highly specialized, uh, fine-tuned, efficient system, it will, you will find that it relies on very specific inputs, and it operates very close to the point of failure. That is, if it's, it's efficient for just one little disturbance or one thing going wrong, and it just all breaks down. The example is a hummingbird, which has to hover from, from flower to flower and feed on it, or it starves to death in a matter of hours. So a uh, technical example is electronic fuel injection. Uh, in, in cars, which is more efficient than a carbureted engine, but the problem that we found just recently is one little earthquake and tsunami knocks out every single uh, fuel injector um, control circuit in the universe. So suddenly we can't make cars anymore. So it turns out that, you know, old carburetors that, you know, I know how to take apart and put together are in some way more resilient than hyper-efficient fuel-injected cars that re require a Japanese component from a factory that's now closed. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get back to gift economies. Uh, there, there's uh, actually quite a bit of uh, research on this. Uh, one French scholar, Marcel Mauss, did quite a bit of research on it, and it turns out that just about every culture in the world started out as a gift economy, where, where it didn't have commerce. They have, ba they have basically exchange of gifts, and examples span just about every community in, in the world, old community in the world. Um, it's very well suited to surviving hard times, because if you think about commerce, and especially commerce based on contracts, um, anytime times go bad, you get endless breach of contract and litigation. So like the foreclosure crisis is, is a prime example. The, the economy tipped in the wrong direction and suddenly you have breach of contract all over the place. So this is something you don't have in a gift economy. If somebody can't 
return the favor of, of the gift that you gave them, then they can't. So what are you going to do? If, if, if you expect somebody to give you a gift in return, even though they can't, then you're not a generous person. So that really destroys the, the idea of generosity, and you lose face, not the person who can't give you a gift, by demanding the gift. So in that sense, uh, uh, gifts are really suited to surviving hard times because uh, they give people a bigger chance to show their generosity. The ones who ha still have things to give away, give them away gladly because that raises their social status. And in this sense, uh, gift economies are self-regulating. They're based on an innate systems of ethics that are universal. They're cultural human universals. And they don't, because of that, they don't require governance. They, they don't need any kind of government control. They don't need legislation. It's all governed through custom and taboo. They also preserve diversity of culture uh, because gifts tend to be unique. They're, they're more highly valued if they're unique than if they're some off-the-shelf product. So if you think about the best gifts, they're the, the, the handcrafted, handmade things that are made locally. Uh, if you think of uh, your average commercial item, it comes in a shrink rack box uh, across the ocean and it's a standardized item. And in this sense, uh, if, if gifts are valued above commerce, then you get much more local production. And gifts create social harmony because um, compet the competition such as it is in a gift economy is in how generous you look. It's not in pursuit of greed or being successful in being greedy. So here's a, a comparison of the two. The gifts, gift giving is motivated by generosity. Uh, any other reason, uh, ulterior motive in, in giving a gift is, is generally results in loss of face. Um, commerce and finance are motivated by, by greed and fear. Those are, anybody who studies economics will tell you that those are really the dominant emotions. Uh, people want more, but they fear losing it. And um, that governs most, uh, most economic commercial interactions. Gifts result in reciprocity, which is the debt of gratitude has to be returned. If somebody can't return the debt of gravity, uh, gratitude, then, then that's bad. And commerce and finance results in competition, which is bad for a number of reasons. First of all, competition involves multiple people trying to do the same thing, most of them failing, which is a waste of effort. It's more efficient to have one person do one thing than multiple people try to do the same thing and fail. Um, in gifts, the value is in, uh, is in uniqueness. Uh, you, you want to give a gift that, that is thoughtful, that is that's fine-tuned to the person who is receiving it. Uh, whereas in commerce and finance, the value is in standardization because then you can do mass production and, and, uh, and, and save a lot of money and make more profit. Gifts must be voluntary. If somebody is coerced to give a gift, then that's automatically not a gift. Um, and and uh, you know there, there are some situations where you're you're absolutely socially expected to give a gift. Uh, that that's a, a degenerate case, I would say, because the best gifts, the, the ones that produce the the greatest debt of gratitude, if you will, are the ones that are are given freely. But commerce and finance can be coercive. Let me give you one example. I live in Massachusetts. Massachusetts requires me to buy health insurance, which is really a gift to the government. So the government says, you must buy this product because then you will owe us a debt of gratitude for taking care of you. That's not a real gift at all. Now, gifts have to be personal. Uh, you have to know the person you're giving a gift to. So charity, which is anonymous, is... Um, not, again, a, a degenerate case. It's not really a gift at all. Uh, I, I will get into that some more. Um, and, and so, um, and commerce is largely impersonal. Everybody gets to pay the same price, and if you, get, if you give everybody a different price based on how much you like them, then, um, you know, that, that is the degenerate case of a market economy. That's not, that's not supposed to happen, and there, in some cases there are laws against, uh, you know, giving different people different prices. Um, gifts tend to be uh, local because you, you give them personally to somebody. You can't, 
you can sometimes ship a gift, but in general, you, you just give a gift directly. And commerce and finance is rather easily globalized uh, through these impersonal worldwide connections. Gifts are based on an innate system of ethics, which is a cultural universal. Everybody understands what gratitude is. Everybody in the world. Uh, I, can, I can even think of some animals that understand the debt of gratitude. Like, if, if you f take care of a cat, once in a while it'll bring you a mouse, you know? And if you don't, it won't. So, even cats get it. Um, and commerce is based on a, a regulatory regime. It's not even based on laws so much as we're finding out more and more. So if you're a Bank of America, you can get away with uh, not quite murder, I wouldn't go that far, but close. And, um, but but if, you're, if you're some, some small credit union, then uh, suddenly somebody can just make a rule and, and your world changes and there's nobody you can talk to. Gifts tend to put limits on production because um, suppose I was going to give you a gold watch, so how much better a gift would it be if I gave you 10 gold watches? Well, that would be just stupid, right? So gifts are ten, are, tend to be self-limiting. Gifts that exceed somebody's needs are generally not such a good idea. Overly lavish gifts are a problem. Um, so a gift economy is really self-limiting as far as production, but commerce and, and finance are all about maximizing production to take advantage of, uh, uh, of uh, mass production and, and to make as much money as possible. There, there are a lot of practices that involve flooding the market in order to squeeze out your competitors and things like that. That just doesn't exist in a, in a gift economy. So a gift economy conserves resources, whereas a com commercial economy squanders resources. Uh, gifts, because, because the people with the most tend to distribute it by, by giving gifts, distributes wealth. And uh, commerce and finance tend to concentrate wealth, and, and you, you can actually see that in, in, in what's happening now. Gifts create trust between people because uh, they, they're basically um, entering into a, a relationship that involves um, um, a lot of fine-tuning, a lot of mutual understanding, a lot of understanding each other's needs, whereas uh, with commerce and finance, you're really trying to get the best deal for yourself. So uh, caveat emptor, emptor, buyer beware is, is the principle in, in, in commerce everywhere. Now, money... Uh, as far as money relates to the gift economy is, is problematic in many ways. If the gift of money is, is considered a really bad gift. You know, it's thoughtless. It's tacky. Some, giving somebody a hundred dollar bill as a present is, is just kind of insulting in some ways. Um, now, money is also a useless artifact. It's not very pretty. Very few people frame bills and put them on walls and ultimately worthless. If you, if you go back a hundred years and you have a big pile of money, you, you tend to use it for bookmarks. You might use it for toilet paper if you run out, kindling, uh, things like that. So it's just a bunch of ugly paper, really, and it's completely useless. Um, and money is used to concentrate power in fewer, in fewer and fewer hand, hands until the revolution comes and it all gets torched. That's sort of a cultural universal, too. Societies go to a certain level of imposed injustice and then there is, if you will, a cultural flip and a whole bunch of people get strung up on lamp poles or have to uh, le flee the country and change careers to driving a taxi cab or things like that. And that just happens all over the place all the time. So the money economy goes through, through crises. Um, it is very difficult to do good by spending money, and this is something that people have a lot of trouble thinking through, but it is really very difficult to spend money in a way that does not contribute to the money economy, which does not necessarily do good. So it's kind of a ratio between undoing a problem and causing other problems, because whenever you spend money, you're causing more problems. So you might be doing good by giving somebody a ride, let's say, but you're doing bad by stimulating the fossil fuel economy because of the gasoline that you burn in the process. And that is just all over the place. And the thing is that by giving gifts that you make that aren't 
that don't start out as part of the money economy. You can actually achieve a good result. But by spending money, by lavishing money on whatever problem exists, you're just perpetuating a system. And who knows whether you're doing something for the benefit of, of everyone involved or, or if you are harming them. And, and um, so that's a really important point. It, it's impossible, close to impossible, to be sure that you're doing good by spending money. So money as a yardstick inspires mediocrity. People, people in the gift economy try to do their best, but uh, people who try to get money for, for their labors um, try to do a job that's just barely good enough. And if it's not good enough, then they, they hope that they don't get caught. So if you compare, let's say, um, op computer operating systems, you, you can compare, let's say, Microsoft, which is a commercial operating system, to Linux, which is uh, based on a, a, um, a PhD project um, started by Linus Torvalds from Finland. And um, Linux is what powers a lot of the corporate internet servers now. It's, it's, it sets the standard in, in high reliability software. Everybody swears by it. It, it never crashes. Linux boxes can sometimes run for many, many, many years without rebooting. They're that reliable. Compare that to Windows, which is just an endless disaster. <laughs> Why? Because people pay for it. <laughs> so the use of money concentrates trust in a single authority, in this case the Federal Reserve and, and our little cabal of, of banks, and once that trust is violated, what do you do? You know, what do you do when you find out that, you know, Bank of America is run by criminals? You still put your money in there. There's nothing you can do. Not well, good for you. But, but anyway, it's really hard not to deal with the system, even if you know that, you know, it's, um, it shouldn't be trusted. So if it, once that trust is really lost, which I think it will be at some point, then it's, it's just a really big black hole at the center of society where, People can't get anything done in the, in, in the manner to which they have become accustomed. So um, GIFT has some extensions, Tribute and Barter. And I want to talk about this because uh, GIFT Pure is a, you know, kind of a, a pure thing. Gratitude is, a, a, let's say, a, one of the purest virtues and emotions that, that we have. Um, and Tribute and Barter are deviations from it in some ways. So tribute involves recurring gifts and, and um, you know, gifts that are made year after year. Uh, two examples are harvest festivals uh, that distribute the, the, the bounty of the harvest. There might also be winter festivals that make sure everyone has enough because the winter and the springtime is when generally everybody starts to, starts to starve or a few people. Um, barter is uh, periodic exchanges of surplus, generally between neighbors. So. Um, you know, this is where kind of efficiency does enter into the picture, but in a good way. Suppose your land is better for growing onions and your, your neighbor's land is better for growing potatoes. Um, well, you might specialize then knowing that once a year uh, at harvest time, you will meet up with your neighbor and you will trade sacks of onions for sacks of potatoes. Now, the onion to potato ratio is not really established by a market system. It's established by how, much, how big your harvest is and what your neighbor's needs are. Those are the things that you take into account. So it's a little bit more like a gift economy than a market economy in that sense. You, you don't actually like market to market because that, that's a kind of ridiculous in a, in a sense. You just have sacks of stuff and you figure out what to do with them because your neighbors. Um, other signs of generosity that are, that are quite possible, very, very reasonable and useful are community labor, where people basically barter their services for somebody else's services. One thing that typically happens is if you need to move, somebody, your friends help you move and then you help them move, um, there's reciprocity, where a specific thing is traded for a specific thing. Um, Community facilities are also a really good way to show generosity. So uh, if, you have, um, if you have a dock on a lake, you let your neighbors use it and tie up their little boats to it because then you can throw parties there and everybody has fun. Nobody really cares that it's your dock. So you're giving it as a present to everyone. 
Um, and gift is, is really good for most other occasions. So uh, you might establish uh, tribute and barter systems where that makes sense, but gift really plugs up all of the remaining holes, and that's, that's the thing to keep in mind. So the thing to understand about gifts is that there is really very little for you to learn. Um, so just to recap, money is a thoughtless gift. Don't, do not give a gift of money. Uh, giving everybody the same gift is, is kind of bad, if you think about it, because not everybody is the same. And um, you, you have to take individuality into account when, when thinking, thinking of a gift. Not everybody has the same needs. Mm -hmm. Regifting is a little bit iffy. There's usually a statute of limitations of, uh, I don't know, a year or so before regifting. Most people understand that principle. Selling a gift, again, you might do it, but you don't tell the person who gave you the gift that you did it, and most people understand that part too. Um, now, complaining about a gift that, that you got, you know, it's like, again, it's, See, these are, this is a cultural universal. This is, I'm explaining this to you because this is such a sidelined part. Of, of our economy, whereas it is a, an absolutely central element of a normal economy. So I'm stressing it, but what I'm pointing out is you already know all this. Okay, so boasting about a gift, gift you gave, you know, don't do that. Um, giving too generous a gift, this is something that some people don't actually understand. The unreasonable onus of reciprocation can ruin the relationship. So you try to give a gift that somebody can actually reciprocate in some manner. Um, and of course, the worst thing you can do is give a gift and then not expect reciprocation. That is an absolute insult. Keeping a gift a secret um, is, is generally strange. Uh, generosity is a public virtue done out in the open. There's, there's no, no benefit to being generous if you're the only person who knows it. There are some special cases like, well, Steve Myers might buy you flowers, but that gets creepy, you know? <laughs> Um, don't give trivial gifts, so um, a box of thumbtacks or a bag of onions, no, not a gift. <laughs> but there's an exception. Um, in, in societies that are, where gift and barter are prevalent, um, you, for instance, in Russia, a sack of potatoes is not a gift. Like it, that's an, a rather insulting gift to give to somebody, is a bag of potatoes. But if people are starving, then the taboos of that sort are automatically lifted. So the system automatically adjusts based on needs, not based on rules or custom or anything like that. It, it's flexible enough for that. And uh, making a gift of something you dislike, like I bought this, but I don't really like it, so I'll give it to you. you know, don't do that either. So the important thing is that gifts are actually uh, amazing in that they bring out the best in us. You know, they, they, they speak to our, uh, to, to our, um, to our, our, our strengths as, you know, as moral individuals. And it's not something that even has to be taught. Now, it's important to stress that certain gifts are not gifts at all. Uh, impersonal gifts, that is, if you don't know the person who's getting it, they're not gifts at all. Largesse is not generosity. Largesse is when you have too much and you give some of it away. So charitable donations are not gifts, endowments are not gifts, other forms of largesse that cannot be reciprocated are not gifts. So they do not give rise to gratitude, they give rise to some actually rather nasty stuff. Um, they give rise to resentment, they give rise to dependency, and they give rise to unjustified feelings of entitlement. This is, again, a cultural universal that you can observe in certain animals. Um, have you ever made the mistake of like, feeding a wild animal somewhere ne near your house? Right? Notice how the animal then shows up day after day expecting to be fed. Notice how mad at you that animal gets if you stop feeding it. There's no debt of gravity, gratitude. It's like, okay, you're a fool. You're feeding me. I will stress that point by biting you if you stop. That is the general relationship with largesse. That, that is not a gift. So the same thing happens with recipients of charity. Charity immediately becomes an entitlement about the second or third time around and remains that way. 
So a gift that can never be reciprocated can be taken as a form of abuse or an insult. It's, it, it's, it becomes uh, a dysfunctional relationship as opposed to a helpful one. So crumbs from the master's table, even if somebody accepts them gladly, they create hostility and alienation. And if you have too much, giving it away to people you don't know and care about is not a solution. So back to the antipodes. One, one thing that occurs to people over and over again is that they can buy their way out of this predicament, kind of thinking back to those people who bought me dinner, those money men. Um, so the problem is they don't know how much it will take. Um, the billion is the new million and the trillion is the new billion and they just don't know how much money they'll take so they'll just, they're just trying to run away with all the loot right now and they're kind of getting into a feverish state about it because the point is no amount of money will fix the problem. And there's a belief coupled to that that you can buy your way out of it which, which is that the industrial economy can smoothly scale down to boutique size all of those uh, offshore oil wells, all of those gigantic recoveries, all of those uh, you know, fleets of jet aircraft, etc., can just like smoothly scale down to where they just serve the super rich and, and remain stable. I don't think that that's possible. I don't, as an engineer, I just don't see how that can ever happen. So then they think about, well, what will happen to money? Will it be hyperdeflation or hyperinflation or hyperstagflation? And some people, smart people like Nicole Foss, you know, have taken sides in, in this debate and, and, and uh, um, have a lot, of, um, a lot to say on the subject. But I think the question reduces to what will be the value of your money once you no longer have any? You know, there are people, there was a speaker here talking about slow money. Um, I think we need to talk about no money. And, you know, people all over this country have this touching faith that the rich will abide, the rich will be with us forever. No matter what happens to the world, somebody will still be rich. And, you know, I think some of them will abide, but if, if enough people owe them personal favors, not otherwise, not, not because they have, um, you know, a banking relationship or, or some gold bullion tucked away somewhere. So the problem with with all of that kind of thinking is the people who understand finance don't understand physical reality and to some extent vice versa. The, the important thing is that the value of financial assets is backed up by future industrial production which is guaranteed to not happen. There really isn't enough physical measurable stuff, fossil fuels, ores, rare earths, phosphate for industrial agriculture, fresh water, many other things to, to sustain the current level of industrial activity, never mind expanding it. Um, I'm working on putting out a book with uh, Chris Clugston, who uh, did a very exhaustive survey of all of the non-renewable resources that don't have substitutes, that are absolute requirements for maintaining an industrial base. And his, his conclusion is that there, there can be no physical economic growth at all from this point on. So what that leads us to is that capital assets, all of the stuff that makes a developed country developed, have maintenance requirements. They, they need a certain level of industrial activity in order to be maintained. If they're not maintained, they fall apart, they stop functioning. There's a constant level of investment and reinvestment required to keep airplanes flying, to keep bridges in a condition where you can drive over them, and so on. And, and that is happening already in many, many places. So once you have that, then capital assets become stranded assets. They become scrap. They become useless. And as that happens more and more, the big investment that was made in them that people expect payments on, you know, will, will, will become worthless. The collateral value will go to zero. Now, people are trying to fix this by various techniques, basically turning knobs on the system financially. Now, the important thing to understand is that nature does not respond to economic stimulus. It does not create more stuff when you print money. It does not respond to price signals. It does not respond to economic incentives or tax policy 
or any other sort of planning. It is what it is. And, and so as a result of this, money will lose value and as a result of that, it will also lose respect. People will show up with all their money and they will be told, your money is no good here, sir, please go away. And that will continue to happen until the message sinks in. So, for as long as we have this dominance of money and commerce, we have the, roughly this organization scheme in society. So, basically, how, how big a person you are in society depends on how many dollar signs there are next to your name. So, you have millionaires, billionaires, maybe some trillionaires at the top. If you have more money, then nobody will oppose you. And um, so, why should, why should it be like this, do you think? Um, it's not really absolutely obvious looking at this chart why it should be that way, but if you flip it upside down, and that's where the, the explanatory power of my upside down metaphor really shines, I think, the antipodal orc chart makes a lot more sense when, it, when it's flipped upside down because now money just drains downhill due to gravity toward the greediest, stingiest, mo morally lowest individuals. And it makes perfect sense. This economy is driven by gravity. So to enter into antipode society, um, you have to take on a role, uh, an economic role. So you have to classify yourself. You, you can be an employer, an investor, an employee, an official, a professional, a skilled worker, an unskilled worker, retired, disabled, or you don't really exist. Now that's also a very important thing because more and more people in this country every day don't really exist. They're not unemployed because their unemployment benefits have run out, right? So as soon as that happens you're no longer unemployed, you don't exist. And, and um, it's the fastest growing class we have in the United States today. Examples include recent college graduates with no prospects of employment. Two-thirds of them are moving back in with their parents if they can. People whose unemployment ran out, a uh, big category. Retirees with insufficient retirement or savings. And that, that's happening more and more as uh, uh, various types of uh, retirements. Um, especially uh, you know, the, the municipal retirements and so on, uh, turn out to be broke. The, the accounts turn out to be broke. And, and uh, young people who are not entering the labor market, who uh, uh, don't get into college and can't get a job. So saying goodbye to the antipodes is what we should all be doing because we don't want to collapse along with them. Things you can do to uh, make it to, to, to sort of slowly drop out of the system, I suppose, as opposed to uh, all at once, is not really define yourself too well. So you can be a freelancer or a hobbyist or a volunteer. Nobody knows what you really are, but, but you get along anyway. And, and the important thing is to just like, you know, not, not get pegged down to any given category that the system comfortably deals with. And uh, use your residual money to reduce and eliminate the need for continued cash flow. So anything you can do that, you can, that allows you to get stuff for, for free from, from your community or from your friends or, or do for yourself, that's a step in the right direction. And the idea is to create closed cycle systems that are very local for, for things that you really need, like food production, like shelter maintenance, like transportation. Entertainment is a big category. People spend a lot of money on that. Uh, reduce, reduce your dependence on impersonal relationships and institutions. You, you know, that this, this, is, this is hard for some people, but um, I think that y you have to basically kind of do a drill, in maybe just a kind of a, a mental drill. What happens if such and such an institution no longer exists? What is my mechanism for compensating for that? And shy away from using monetary equivalents and, and try to rely on gifts and uh, various types of extensions and generalizations of gifts as much as possible. You can create new sorts of customs and rituals within, among your friends and within your local community that help transform it into more of a gift and barter economy and, and allow you to create a, the, the sort of culture that, that will stand a chance. I think that's it.
That's it. Thank you.